Hi everyone, Biebs here, welcome back to the channel. I'm back in Budapest working on some stuff with the guys at Fibonari and I thought I'd continue making videos while I'm out here. So this is a bit of a lesson, a bit of a nice jam for me to do some playing. Basically I was consuming all of the Nano Cortex content and stumbled down a rabbit hole on Rabia Massad's channel. Now I rediscovered a really cool older video of his from maybe a year or two ago where he was improvising and just like jamming over this really sort of hauntingly beautiful chordal loop he came up with. So really, really cool and super inspiring. And I thought I would play over it myself and maybe just do a little lesson on some of the things that I'm thinking about when improvising in this sense. I'll put a link to Rabia's original video in the description below so you can check out his cool playing and his thoughts and take on that in the video. Like I say, it's a really interesting video in and of itself, so definitely check that out but specifically the chordal loop he's come up with is really beautiful and um, super interesting. It's difficult to play over, it's difficult to navigate and sort of visualize on the neck. Now we're not gonna go into the theory of like what's going on harmonically here today or like why I'm choosing certain things to play. What I want to try and do is just discuss some um, of the techniques and things that I use in order to sort of visualize and navigate sort of changes that are on the surface level like disparate or have chromatic differences between them or they don't all fit neatly and want into one scale. Obviously it should go without saying but I'll just add a little disclaimer. Everything I'm doing here is just what works for me. I'm not saying it's the way or the right way um, but certainly these working on these kind of things has helped me be able to tackle these kind of tricky shifts and changes and playing over changes. I remember back in the day at Jazz College of Music School when uh, this kind of a change or chord progression would have completely crippled me. So yeah, I definitely remember the pain and <laughs> hitting all the wrong notes, not being able to see where I want to go and play. Um, and thankfully, like on a good day, that that's uh, a thing of the past now. Okay, I'm jumping in here with a little plug because I forgot to do it as I was recording in the beginning. If you're really interested and you get something out of this video, do like, subscribe, all that usual stuff. And if you want to learn more about this and the fretboard visualization, you could check out the Solo app. We also have the Ultimate Fretboard Visualization course, which teaches you this two-point intervallic system we're gonna be talking about. And if you wanna get the transcription of my solos for this video and presets, backing tracks, that's on my Patreon in the description. Okay, back to the video. Okay then, so the chordal loop itself. Like I say, it's this beautifully haunting sort of shifting sounds in that we've got basically an E flat major triad or just E flat and a third really, the E flat and the G. Moving to an E minor triad. So the, the root note there is moving up a half step. And that's what's kind of creating much of the problems that we're gonna be faced with later on. So we go from E flat major triad, E flat major to E minor. And then I may have changed this from Rabia's loop, I, I can't remember now, but I'm treating the next chord, it's like C add two. That's the way that I'm treating it. Yes, I definitely did change it. Quick editor note breaking in here. So I made that backing track over on the plane ride here. I was doing it from memory, didn't have access to the original, so I got the harmonic rhythm messed up. So mine does the E flat for a bar, E minor for a bar, and then two bars on the C. Rabia's original does two bars on the E flat. One bar on the E minor. And one on the C. Back to the E flat. So slightly different vibe, um, but yeah, the actual problem of navigating the change is pretty much the same. Now, because the chords are quite sparse in their voice scenes, it does actually leave and open you up to treat them in different ways. There's plenty of other options you could explore. I'm not gonna go into how and why all that works or the modal interchange that's kind of underpinning all this. Uh, maybe that's for another day. Like I say, what I wanna do is sort of show you how to make, basically navigate this shift going from the E flat major to the E minor. But very briefly, if you are interested, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking here. So I'm thinking of the first chord, the E flat major, as like an E flat Lydian or E flat major seven sharp 11, which is coming from C Dorian. And then as it shifts up to the E minor triad, I'm now thinking of this as E natural minor coming from C Lydian. And then as the chord goes to the C, 
I'm treating it as Celidian. So you can kind of boil this down to just sort of two or three sounds or two sounds and three ways of visualizing it. So like an E flat Lydian kind of sound. And then an E natural minor. Um, and then C Lydian. As I say, there are plenty of other options here, but this is what I'm going to be thinking of and hearing harmonically and sort of showing you and working through how to navigate and shift between this on the neck. So step one, the first thing I would do is to put scales and modes to one side. Don't think about that at all for now. And just think about the chord tones and learn to see where they fall and land on the neck. So if we were to take like an E flat triad, an E minor triad, and a C triad, and then just be able to see where they all fall, thinking of them intervallically. Now you could learn these as sort of your brute force triad shapes. If you don't know them, I highly recommend that you do learn them. They're the backbone of so much of what we do on the guitar. But whilst you're learning the triads, I would strongly encourage you to see them not as like fixed blocks where you will see, okay, well, this is my E flat triad and this is my E minor triad and this is my C triad. Try to look with inside of them and to see the intervallic makeup that they have. So you could do this by focusing not on it as inversions, but I would take that one step further and to be able to see it independent of any big, large structure and shapes. So if I just take whatever I put my hand, if I see here like, okay, well, I'm thinking of E flat triad. Well, there's my E flat, here's my five, and there's my third. Here's my E flat, so here's my five, there's my third. So I'd spend some time just sitting in the chord progression and sitting in those triads, just kind of making, uh, making the changes just by being able to see where they fall. So. The next thing we're gonna do is really zoom in on that E flat triad and the E minor triad and tackle this in a little bit more detail. This is what's gonna give people most trouble. It's what would have definitely caused me all the problems back in the day. And that's because they're kind of non-diatonic to one another. They're sort of like shifting chromatically in a way that is unhelpful to us as guitar players because we can't just like brute force one shape over the whole thing. I am treating the last chord, the C, is largely the same kind of overarching kind of sound as the E minor triad. So the guitar player in me can then just like force his one shape. I'm still not saying you should do that, but that we can do. The first two chords, the change from the E flat triad to the E minor, there is nothing you can do about that. You have to tackle that change that you either do it, you know, if you've got great ears, you can just do it naturally, or if you can do it intellectually with a you know, visualization plan, whatever. But the, you cannot avoid navigating that change. Um, there has to be some kind of shift either in your mind or your visualization or your ear, however you do it. Um, and that's why it's so tricky. So the, the really good thing to do once you've got the triads down is to try to see where the, cha where the sort of chromatic shift is. Where are the notes, what are the common tones, and then what are the notes that are different, and then where are the notes that are different that shift by a half step. So it might seem really obvious and really simple, but this is the thing that will probably trip you up, uh, as it's tripped me up in the past, is even just the first root note of those, those two, first two chords. So going from the E flat to the E, you could spend a lot of time just sitting within that, just from the E flat, and then thinking and hearing it through to the E. And as that shifts, how do the other notes shift around it? So on the E flat triad, I'm gonna have the five, the B flat, and then they're both gonna shift by a semitone, so the E flat's gonna fall rise to the to the E up a half step. The B flat's gonna rise up a half step to the B. But that G, which was the major third of the E flat, is gonna remain the same. That's the common tone that the you know the voice leads and follows through the progression, kind of glues them together, if you like, to then to that E minor triad. 
That becomes the flat three of the E minor triad. This might seem simple and obvious, but it's in the heat of battle when we're having to navigate those changes that that can actually be really quite a tricky thing to do, is to be able to see the detail within what you're playing and make that smooth shift. So you could just practice like sitting in your triads, comfortably seeing and hearing the details there. So you can really hear that shift from the E flat to the E minor and you're in control of what you're playing. Now the change to the C is probably gonna be slightly easier for your ear to navigate, perhaps on autopilot, but I'd still recommend that you spend the time and you work on like outlining and choosing to hit the root of the C, or choosing to hit the five, or choosing to hit the three. So it might do something like this. I might play like, um, and actually I will talk out the intervals, I will speak the intervals out loud here. This is another really useful thing to practice is actually orally and out loud with your mouth say the things that you're playing. It's a really great way to just like iron into your memory and or to really force you to be on top of things. So I might go three, one, five, five, three, one, five, one, three, three, saying everything here it's kind of hard but uh, yeah do as I say not as I do <laughs> sorry if there's any strange noises I think someone outside has got a bandsaw going so yeah I'll try and get rid of that in the background but yeah if there's any weird sounds coming through that's probably what it is oh I've just thought of another like step 1a between step 1 and 2 you could try this is to help sort of practice voice leading your triads um, so let's just take the triads for each of the chords and on the top three strings, say. And then I want to sort of practice voice leading to the next smoothest one. So let's say I'm gonna do the E flat and go here. So this is, you know, like cowboy chord D shape, shifted up a, a one fret there. So I've got the one on the B string fret four, the three on the high E string fret three, and the five on the G string fret three. Now I wanna try and move into the E minor triad with moving as little as possible. So what I would do is then play this E minor triad. So I can see that the three is gonna, the three of the E flat major is gonna remain the, that note and become the flat three of E minor. The root is gonna move up to the, the root of E flat is gonna to move to the root of E. And then the five of B flat is gonna to move to the five of E minor. So I go from, to the, uh, to the E minor. Now I'm gonna shift into the C triad. So then all I need to do here is, and this beautiful voice leading going on now, is that I just can shift up this B note here on fret four, which is the five of E minor, is gonna just slide up by a semitone into the third, sorry, into the root of C major. And the other notes stay the same. So now what was the root of E minor becomes the third of E major, and what was the third the flat three of E minor becomes the five of C major. So we've gone from the E flat triad, voice lead it up, voice lead it up. Now you could take this now, just continue it up the neck. So as it rolls back over into E flat, I'm gonna find my next closest E flat triad. Then into my closest E minor triad and my C triad. And you can just keep doing that. So E flat triad, E, e minor, and G, C major. And of course you want to do this on all of your string sets and get good at seeing and thinking through the details of each triad and how they're kind of moving um, from one to the other. Okay, so step three, or at least I think it's step three, the one eighth has thrown me a little bit. But for this one, this is something I've done on the channel before in a previous lesson actually, and that's try to maintain a consistent note um, throughout the progression or, or move it where you have to. So I'll link to the video in the description where I teach this technique elsewhere, but this is what I would perhaps do next. And again, it's gonna help you just navigate and see these shifts between the sort of chromatic movements and non-diatonic chords. So, 
uh, let's say I choose, I'll do it with chord tones to begin with because that's most straightforward. So if I choose the root note of E flat, now I want to keep that note as the chord changes unless I have to move it. Now, obviously this is the whole point. I have to move it here. So this is going to move uh, up to the E. So I'm going to go from the E flat up to the E. Now as the chord changes again to the C, I want to ask myself the question, does this note belong to the chord of the next chord we're going to? So we're going to C major, and this is the third, because it's the third um, of C. So I can hold that note. So I'm not moving, I'm just going from the E flat, changing to the E minor, holding it because I can into the C. Then I might choose a different starting note, so you could do it from the other chord tones. So let's say I was, um, I was on the G, it's from the, so this is the third of E flat. As it goes to the E minor, I can hold it because it becomes the flat three of E minor. And then in fact, this one carries all the way through as the chord changes to the C, I can hold it for that one as well. So it becomes the five of C. Okay, so step four. <laughs> now we're into the real meaty stuff. And I think this is where it starts to get maybe a little bit more exciting potentially, certainly for playing faster things much later on, but it's given us more notage to play with, <laughs> um, if that's a good thing. I don't know, it's not always a good thing, is it? But you might be thinking about, well, how do I apply this to scales and actually get like melodic content from this and not just stick to like what can become quite boring with just triads. So, like I say, Ignore the reasons as to why, you don't have to really understand why I've chosen these scales, but I'm going to be working with E flat Lydian. E natural minor. And then C Lydian. So the obvious first thing to say is you need to know how to play and see those scales on the neck. Now I'm not really going to be teaching you how to do that here, there's a million ways you can do that. It's a not particularly great use of time for me to just teach you how to play those scales. But when you do know them, I think what's going to be more useful and relevant to you is how to practice organising, moving through and changing between those scales. So this is an exercise that over the years I've called like the continuous uh, scale exercise. I know it's not my thing, um, but it's definitely something that I've worked on an awful lot. And this, for guitar players, it's really good because this continuous scale exercise gets you to think through a changing scales as opposed to always coming back to your root note to start. So this, I think, really aids in your fretboard visualization, in your sort of moving through changes. It was a massive, massive part of my playing coming together maybe 10 years ago when I was sort of learning to sort of play through standards and improvise through changes and things. So if I take, uh, rather than, so rather than going like always sort of coming back to the root notes and starting the scales from the root, I want to just like play through the progression and choose a subdivision, like or choose however many notes you want to play. And then after you've played those notes, move into the next closest note to the next scale. So let's take the E flat major and like I say, I'm going to do an E flat Lydian scale. So I'm going to play eight notes of that scale. I'm going to play a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Now as the chord changes into the E minor, I want to change my scale at that point to E natural minor. So I'm going to play E Aeolian. Now, rather than going back to the root note on the same string, I want to just continue on from where I left off. So from this E flat here, I'm going to move from that into my E natural minor scale, so... and play another eight notes. And then from there, move into my last scale, I guess I'm going to play over the C, which is C Lydian. But rather than going from a C or going back to my starting note, I'm going to continue the direction I'm coming. So this is reversing um, through, the, through the neck here and come down to the next closest available note, which would be this, the, the G or the five of C Lydian. So I then play eight notes from uh, C Lydian. And then maybe keep coming down it as well. 
And as I, re as I get to the end of the sort of area of the fretboard that I'm working in or run out of strings, I'll reverse it back up again. So the point here is that we're kind of uh, locking into a specific number of notes to play and keep maintaining a specific direction moving um, either ascending up the neck or descending the neck. So I'll just demonstrate this for you slowly and talk it through out loud. So I'm going to play with the E flat Lydian, I'm going to play the first eight notes. Move smoothly into E Aeolian or natural minor and play the eight notes. And then move smoothly into C Lydian and play the eight notes. There's another bar of the C isn't there, so I can do another eight. And then um, we're going to be moving back into, as the chordal loop comes around, into the E flat Lydian again. So we continue the direction because I was, I was on this C note here and I was ascending. So I'm going to go into the closest note um, that's going to fit the E flat Lydian. So that will be the seven, the D, and then play eight notes. And then into E natural minor. And so on like that. Now, this can be really tricky at first. It takes a lot of kind of um, com computer <laughs> computing, <laughs> compute power in the brain and overhead. And it, it kind of requires you to know your sort of scale shapes really well or know your intervals really well. And that would be my strongest recommendation is to think of all of this intervallically. Because if you can do that, it's gonna make these shifts, I, I think, much, much easier to make. So let me talk it through intervallically for you and see if, and so you can see what, I'm, what I mean. If I'm starting on the E flat and I'm playing through the eight notes, I'm gonna be, now what I'm saying, I'm talking to you in terms of the intervals I'm playing, not the number of notes I'm playing. That's just gotta kinda of keep ticking away. You've also gotta keep track of that. So uh, yeah, let's do it. So I've got the root, two, three, sharp four, five, six, seven, root, change, root, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, come back, so five, four, change, so then this becomes the five of Celidian, sharp four, three, two, one, uh, seven, six, five. So I'm really consciously aware of what each note is intervallically functioning within the context of the scale and the context of the harmony that we're playing in. So it's that kind of thing that will allow you to play longer lines or longer, longer runs of lines and notes that are going to smoothly weave into the different sounds and make those shifting changes. So for example, in this ex specific example here, we go like... So it navigates that sort of awkward shift in a really smooth way where I'm in control of it, consciously, um, from a visual perspective, from a listening and oral perspective, and I'm not lost in any way on the fretboard there. And you want to do that like from as many different places as you can, um, all over the fretboard, you know, however you kind of sort of categorize this in your mind, whether the, you do these as three note strings or caged, or the way that I do it with the sort of intervallic function shapes and thinking intervallically, however you do it, you want to be able to be comfortable doing this all over the fretboard. Oh, the other thing to say is don't always start it from the root note, okay? So very, very common like pro habit to get into as guitar players especially, you know, we just always start our scales up from the root note, go up to the root note and come back down again. Now we've been getting away from that a little bit because we've just been running up till we run out of fretboard and string and all the way down until we run out of fretboard and string, which is a good way to help getting around that. Um, but starting specifically from the third or from the five or from wherever really is another great way to kind of break you out of those boxes and those kind of roots. So, you know, I, I might sort of start, I might say, okay, well, I'm going to play eight notes from the third. And so from the E flat Lydian, I might just be here. So I might arbitrarily choose the third here on the 10th fret of the, of the A string and then do eight notes through E flat Lydian, but starting on the third. The solo app, is really useful for practicing scales in this way. Um, I'll link to that in the description. And yeah, you can definitely set up the scale trainer in solo to help you sort of work and practice scales in this manner. So in this example here, I was playing, starting on the third of E flat Lydian and playing the eight notes. So I would get the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now as it changes into the E minor, 
The next closest note is going to be the fourth here, which is that A note, and that's not a chord tone. So we can make it sound much smoother if I was to have landed on that G, the note before, because that would be a, the chord tone of E minor. That would be the flat three of E minor. So what I want to do, which would sound much, much better, or not better, but it's going to be smoother in, for this example, is to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then play a chromatic passing note that's going to then link me and like glue the chains together so I hit the flat three of the E minor there. Now that's kind of might not work very well stylistically or for the vibe that we're going for. Um, we're kind of like dipping a toe into um, more kind of jazz territory here very, very slightly. So it might not be particularly relevant or work all the time, but certainly, you know, chromaticism is useful for all styles of music and being in control of your chromaticism and where you're landing and placing chord tones, regardless of your stylistic tendencies, um, it's going to be useful for you to work and work on and practice. Okay then, last but by no means least, if all else fails, you can pull the pentatonic parachute and you know, find some familiar territory uh, to be able to kind of navigate your way through these changes. Now, um, this is completely, this is gonna help you language-wise because it's so guitar-y, vocabulary and language. And you hear me as I improvise in the, um, in the opening jam, there's a couple of times where I, where I certainly do do this. Um, it's kind of intentional to try and get some of that in because I think it's just so important for us as guitar players. And as I say, if you do get, uh, completely out of your depth, then it's a good get out of jail free card. So uh, I, what I'm doing here is I'm just thinking of my pentatonic shapes, the pentatonic options I have from a minor perspective here for me, myself really. So of the E flat, I'm thinking of either like a C minor pentatonic or a G minor pentatonic. For the rest of it, I've got either an E minor pentatonic And then just trying to maintain the consistency of moving to the smallest gaps between them again. Um, that's in, uh, you know, in, in theory, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay then, so that just about wraps up everything I wanted to cover in this little mini lesson. Um, if you are interested in going deeper and learning these kind of things, then obviously you could check out for fretboard visualization. There's the solo app, as I mentioned already, and the ultimate fretboard visualization course um, for learning how to really kind of see the fretboard with this two point interval system. That's Super, super good. It's the most powerful way, in my opinion, for uh, kind of navigating through these kind of changes. And if you'd like to learn more about the theory and the harmony and the kind of how to play all these kind of changes, I've got courses on my own website at davidbb.com that you could check out. All the links for that is in the description below. Of course, and definitely, of course, check out Rabia's original video. And, and if you'd like to get the tabs, transcriptions for anything I've been playing for this lesson, the backing track, the presets that I'm using, then they're all available on my Patreon, which is linked in the description too, um, along with Fibonacci guitars. And I think that's all the plugging out of the way. Oh, the podcast as well, Guitar Hour podcast, check that out too. We're back, we're doing episodes again. Thanks so much for watching and until the next one, bye-bye. <laughs>